The president of the company is Alan H. Sloan. During the last few years, they've been putting up high-rise apartments. Some are sold on completion, others Sloan operates himself. Their current project is Sloan Towers, a 28-story hotel with a large underground shopping mall. The price tag is 42 million. We'll be hitting four main locations. Sloan's head office, his branches in Vancouver and Montreal, and his residence. Anything to report there, Steve? We've been keeping an eye on the house, nothing unusual. Regular occupants are Mr. and Mrs. Sloan, a son age 22, and a domestic. We'll be entering all locations simultaneously at 11 a.m. I'll be taking seven men with me to the main office. Mike, I'd like you to take charge of the moving van. Have it standing by from 11.30. Steve will be in charge of the Sloan residence. You'll have three men with you, Steve. The alleged fraud occurred during the construction of the Sloan house. The house was built by Sloan's company two years ago at a time when they were also constructing a high rise known as the Embassy Apartments. The cost of the concrete for the house was transferred to the cost of the apartment building. Now this, of course, made Sloan's profit appear smaller when he sold the building. And the amount of the alleged fraud is $8,200. The Sloan Towers administration will be completely divorced from our other operations. Bert will be vice president, finance. Claude will no longer be directly attached to Sloan Towers. There's room at the top for three vice presidents, depending on how much you and Schenker can raise, and one or two could be American. We've got 10 million on the line, contingent on our raising another 10. Now you've got 20 million? Approximately, with more coming. Our first lead, came from one of our assessors on a routine audit of the Perfection Cement Company. He noticed an invoice to Sloan Construction for work described as additional concrete poured for embassy apartments. However, the delivery slips attached to the invoice clearly indicated that the concrete was poured at 38 Riverside, Sloan's residence. And I see a breakdown on your investors with the amounts firmly committed and tentative. You've given all that to Bert? Yes, it's in my office. Take photocopies if you like. Good. See you later. Timothy Hewitson's joining us for lunch. I think you'll be impressed by his group. Stay for a moment, will you, Claude? 8.3%. What? Our costs are up 8.3% over last year. I did a complete breakdown last night. You must have been up all night. Let things slip, you're out of business. The main question is whether the loading of apartment costs was a one-shot deal. We have reason to believe it wasn't. We want a good close look at the invoices from the other subcontractors on the house. Many of them are photostats and, well, we think there's something funny. Also, the company's travel receipts. We think we have evidence that Mr. Sloan was in two places at one time. Anything you'd like to add, Mr. Adams? No, I think you've covered everything, Roy. Uh, just remember, though, I'd like regular reports here throughout the day. I'll be hearing from Montreal and Vancouver, and there may be things to coordinate. Well, good luck. I want to get through to him as soon as he hangs up. Well, try the other two numbers, and don't disconnect. Yes, sir, I'll keep trying. That's it. Not bad. Still three minutes. Let's go around the block. Looks like Mr. Sloan will be there to receive us his car in front. Remember, it's important to stay with Mr. Sloan at all times. What if he wants to leave? Well, we can't stop him. But let me know so we can make sure his car is searched. Sloan Jr. Okay. You want me to stick close to Mrs. Sloan? Very. 
Had a job last year. First thing I knew, the wife tried to flush some papers down the john. customers. Yes, I think we can do a little business here. Good morning, Sloan Construction. One moment, please. Good morning. We'd like to see Mr. Sloan, please. Do you have an appointment? No, but it's a matter of some urgency. Uh, Mr. Sloan is on long distance. Would you have a seat, please? It authorizes us to search the house and seize any records that might relate to your husband's business. With your permission, Mrs. Sloan, I'd like to bring my other men in. The neighbors might begin to wonder. I think I'd better call my husband. Uh, Mrs. Sloan, our men will be talking to him right now. They'll ask him to call you as soon as he's able. Yes, I think I can be there by six. Where shall I meet you? Would you try Mr. Sloan again, please? He's still talking to New York. I'll let you know when he's off. May we see Mr. Harmon? I think he's with a client. If you'd like to sit down, I'll try to find out. I'm afraid we can't wait, miss. Ed Ross has the full picture from our financial man. And he's welcome to any files he may want to take back with him to New York. Hold on a second, Norman, will you? I'm sorry this is necessary, Mr. Sloan. My name is Maxwell, Department of National Revenue. This is Mr. Cole and Officer Boyko, the RCMP. We have a warrant here to search your offices. Uh, uh, Norman, uh, uh, sorry, S something unexpected. I'll get back to you later. Oh, sure, sure, before lunch. You're fine. Uh, thanks, Norman. It's all right, Mary. You'll note the warrant includes your home, Mr. Sloan. We'd appreciate it very much if you telephone your wife. Our men are there now, but we won't start until you've called. Would you mind telling me what this is all about? It concerns a violation of the Income Tax Act. What violation? It's described in an affidavit filed with Superior Court Judge William O'Donnell. I'm afraid this is beyond me. I'll have to call my lawyer. That's fine, but I would like to post my men in your various offices here. Yes? Mr. Bloom is calling. He says it's important. Nathan, I'm just going to call you. There's some people here from the tax department. They walked in as if they owned the place. What are they doing there? I'm sure we'll hear from him at any moment, Mrs. Sloan. I've told you we're preparing for 50 guests tonight. The caterers are coming this morning. Perhaps you should try to phone them, see if they can hold off until two or so. Yes, Mary? Your home phone number is busy, Mr. Sloan. Okay, keep trying, will you? Very well, sir. Mr. Sloan, this is Mr. Cole who'll be searching this office. I think it might be a good idea if you explain to your staff that we have a right to be here and to ask them to cooperate. Yes? Montreal office is calling, sir. Hello. Yes, Gabby, I know. They're here, too. Looks like they're taking over the business. Yes, please do that. Thank you. He's on the phone, and I'll have him call you as soon as he's through. Well, I may as well get dressed. Uh, Mrs. Sloan, would you be doing that in your bedroom? If you have no objections. Well, if you don't mind, we'd rather you didn't use that room until we've searched it. I'm 
sorry about this, but Alan wants me to be on that Montreal plane with him in less than an hour. I understand. Well, I'll see you next week in New York. What's going on? Oh, it's all part of the reorganization. The new accounting firm is doing an audit. They do a thorough job. I'm telling you, Margaret, I've been trying to call you. This office has been a madhouse. Investigators ransacking the place. Calls from Montreal, Vancouver. I don't know. One of those ridiculous bureaucratic foul-ups the government's always making. Nathan Bloom is seeing the judge who signed the warrant to try to get to the bottom of it. No. And I don't want you calling him either. Just cooperate with them. You're the secretary treasurer? Yes. Could you give me an explanation of your accounting system? Well, it's quite simple, really. Money comes in and money goes out, and we try to keep track of it all. It's here where Mr. Sloan is working. Mm -hmm. That isn't locked, is it? Mr. Sloan doesn't like when you touch something. Oh, well, be careful, Mrs. Stephan. You're not leaving us much. We're trying not to take anything current. It was in the desk. Interesting. Oh, excuse me. I wonder if you could tell me whose office this is. Miss O'Neill's. Mr. Sloan's private secretary. Is she in? Not yet. She'll be in at lunchtime. Well, this is interesting. Blank restaurant receipts. Quite a collection. Coffee? No, thank you. No, thanks. That's current. There's some papers there on Sloan Towers. But most of this file pertains to last year's accounts. Thank you, Mary. If you tell me what you're looking for, maybe I can help. The serial number. You don't really think this sofa was stolen, do you? Can't you at least tell me the basis for all this? What exactly is the charge? I'm afraid it's not within my terms of reference to go into that, Mr. Sloan. Your lawyer will be able to get the alleged violation from the judge who signed the warrant. And when the alleged violation is found to be without substance, who compensates me for this invasion? Have you any idea what this disruption is costing me? I thought this country had a civil rights act. Or does that just apply to minority groups and radicals? <laughs> Miss O'Neill? Yes. Thank you. Oh. Not bad.
But we understood you're Mr. Sloan's private secretary. I am not his private secretary. I'm his administrative assistant. Well, in any case, we'd appreciate it very much if you'd give us a sample from your typewriter. Alan, do I have to put up with all this nonsense? Now what? We need samples from all your typewriters. We're asking the regular user to type this standard paragraph. Miss O'Neill is not a typist. She rarely uses that machine. But it's in her office. How's that? Fine. I wonder if you'd mind signing it. I'm sorry this was necessary, Mrs. Sloan. We try to inconvenience you as little as possible. I think you'll find everything in good order. We're leaving the offices exactly as we found them. Well, not exactly. When will we get the stuff back? It could be some time. There's a lot of material to go through. Well, I'm sorry if we've kept you off from lunch. Oh. That's all right. Now, Mr. Sloan has my card. Just notify my office if you need access to anything we take. Nice meeting you. I guess I mean it would be nice meeting you under different circumstances. $8,200. I couldn't believe it when Bloom told me that's what this was all about, all these Gestapo tactics. Isn't this something the father should know about? Maybe he can talk to Senator. I've got John Bearden to handle it. John Bearden? He's trying to get an injunction to force them to return everything. Set up a meeting with them first thing in the morning. Couldn't they just have sent you a bill for the amount owing? That's what Bearden said. He's talking about an action for prejudicial damages. How do they behave here? They were very polite. Of course, that didn't make it any less upsetting. Don't forget that. You were upset. Bearden would be interested in knowing that. Barging into people's private lives. I had to cancel a meeting with Timothy Hewitson this afternoon. You know, you don't have to be there tonight. I could handle things. Well, there may be some questions from the press. Did you see this? What? Alan H. Sloan, president of Sloan Construction Limited, announced last night that his firm has pledged to build a school for retarded children at cost. Cost? That's what it says. Does it say who's cost? Plumbing and Heating Company. Looks reliable. Now Sloan sure picks his subcontractors carefully. See you later. If the shock I get at LeBlanc Electric isn't fatal. Frankly, I'm surprised, even shocked, that the department would proceed on such a course over such a relatively minor discrepancy. Certainly a matter of this kind could have been settled without upsetting my client's normal practice of business and possibly damaging his reputation. Well, that was not our intention, Mr. Bearden. But surely power of this kind to invade premises and carry off truckloads of records is meant to be exercised with utmost discretion. It's a power we don't enjoy using, Mr. Bearden, and the decision to do so is not based on an arbitrary whim. I believe we can justify the action we've taken and are continuing to take. Here's another invoice to Sloan Construction. Additional plumbing installations at Embassy Apartments. But your employees' timesheets indicate that this work was done at 38 Riverside. Must be a mistake. Like the other mistakes? Some people are stupid. They make a lot of mistakes. Uh -huh. You know who lives at 38 Riverside? My, I 
time in the foggiest. Here's a copy of the job contract, $4,600. Why can't I find this entry in any of your books? Why can't you ask my bookkeeper? But you're the general manager. You're responsible for the books, aren't you? Uh, I don't supervise every entry. Well, under the circumstances, Mr. Hogan, I'm afraid I have no choice but to exercise my ministerial authority and seize these books and records. <laughs> and what do you think I'm going to be doing while you're at season? Perhaps you didn't know that, Mr. Sloan, at this very moment is in the midst of delicate negotiations with investors. You can imagine the effect of any unfavorable publicity, no matter how unfounded. For this reason, I've been able to prevail upon him to consider a settlement. Mr. Sloan has agreed to have his accountant re-examine the item in question, and if a bookkeeping error has occurred, he will make immediate restitution for the full amount, $8,200. Conditional, of course, on the return of his records. Perhaps you'd like to comment on this, Mr. Sloan. What is it? It was found at Mr. Sloan's residence. It's an invoice from an interior decorator for $28,500 for work described as furnishing and decorating 10 suites in the majestic apartments. Mr. Sloan owns the building. The $28,500 was claimed as a business expense. Nothing wrong with that. And these are the decorator's receipts for the furnishings. $4,000 gold Chesterfield set, three color televisions, $1,500 stereo, quite a few more. All these items of furniture were found in Mr. Sloan's residence. They have the serial numbers. If it was claimed as a business expense, it's because my accountant considered it allowable. I use my home a great deal for entertaining clients. I'm no expert on the fine points of tax law. Mr. Hogan, I've shown you my authority. Now, if you want verification, I suggest you call your attorney. He's out of town. Well, in that case, I'd better call my office. Perhaps my supervisor. It's a payphone down the street. And of course, you guarantee that everything will still be here when I get back. Sure. Mr. Hogan, I've shown you my authorization, and I've explained the law. It's entirely up to you now whether you want to bring other charges against yourself by resisting me. Well, I think it's obvious to all of us that Mr. Sloan has been the victim of some unfortunate advice from his accountant. What would be your reaction, Mr. Adams, if specialists from my firm were to sit down with Mr. Sloan and his accountant and make a complete reappraisal of the returns of the years in question? for the purpose of discovering any discrepancies or misinterpretations, and for the further purpose of making a full admission and immediate payment on account. I think that would be a positive step, Mr. Bearden, and we'll be pleased to make the seized records available to you at any reasonable time. But please understand this. We can give you no assurance that any action you may take will influence the action we may take in the final disposition of this case. What do you mean, final disposition? In the months ahead, we'll be analyzing every transaction you've made over the last five tax years, examining every book entry, every contract, every receipt. If our analysis produces evidence to support criminal charges, we'll have little choice as to our recommendation. Prosecution. Prosecution. You are further charged, Alan Harold Sloan, that between the first day of January 1967 and the 30th day of April 1971, you did commit an offense under Section 1321D of the Income Tax Act to wit, to evade payment of income taxes imposed by the said act. How does the Crown elect to proceed? By indictment. Upon each of these charges, you have the option to be tried by a judge without a jury or by a court composed of a judge and a jury. How do you elect to be tried? by a judge without a jury. Thank you. After considerable deliberation, and although it is most unusual, I have ordered that this preliminary hearing be held in camera, with the exception of the immediate family of the accused. In making this decision, I have seriously considered the request of defense and noted the consent of the prosecutor. You may proceed, Mr. Mesler. 
Thank you, Your Honor. The Crown will present evidence to show that the accused, during the five-year period mentioned in the charges, willfully evaded payment of tax in the amount of $315,225.14. This total amount is comprised of 18 separate items. Item number one involves the construction of the accused's residence at 38 Riverside in this city. The Crown will present evidence to show that the total cost of the home was $114,000 and that this full amount was charged to the cost of the embassy apartments, which Mr. Sloan's company was constructing at the same time. In all cases, the subcontractors who worked on the Sloan home were also working concurrently on the embassy apartments. The court will hear testimony from 11 subcontractors in all, and the Crown now calls the first, Mr. Donald Burton. Would you state your full name, please? Donald Lewis Burton. Your occupation? Vice President, Perfection Cement Company. Mr. Burton, in the years 1967-68, were you a subcontractor in the construction of the embassy apartments? Yes, we poured the concrete. During the same period, was your company involved with Mr. Sloan in the construction of a private home? Yes, we poured the foundation for Mr. Sloan's home. We also poured the swimming pool. Mr. Burton, I show you now what appears to be a contract between your company and Sloan Construction, dated October 21st, 1967. Do you recognize it? It's our contract for the Embassy Apartments job. Did your company do any additional work on the Embassy Apartments? No, sir. I show you now what appears to be a carbon copy of an invoice bearing your company's letterhead. It's addressed to Sloan Construction and dated April 25th, 1968. Do you recognize it? Yes, sir. Would you read the work description, please? Additional concrete for embassy apartments. Mr. Burton, I understood from your earlier testimony that your company did no additional work at the embassy apartments. That's correct. Then what is this invoice for? It's for the concrete we poured at the Sloan residence. I see. And you issued a false invoice. Well, just the description. Thank you. Could these be filed as our first exhibit, please? Numbers one and two. Mr. Burton, why did you issue a false invoice? Well, I, I did you didn't. benefit from it? No, sir. Then why? Sloan requested it as a favor. They said they wanted it to offset an error in their internal accounting. Did you question this? Well, no. They're one of our best customers. I, I didn't Thank you, feel... Mr. Burton. You may cross-examine. Mr. Burton, you said that Sloan requested this favor. Was it, in fact, Mr. Sloan himself who requested it? No. Who was it? Claude Harmon. Mr. Sloan's secretary treasurer? Yes, sir. Mr. Burton, as a businessman, can you tell the court if it is ever necessary to make offsetting entries in your books to correct errors? Yes, quite often. Well, do you have any reason to believe that this is not exactly what Mr. Harmon did? No, sir, I believe Mr. Harmon. Thank you. You may step down. Call Roy Maxwell. Call Roy Maxwell. I now show you what appears to be an invoice under the letterhead of the LeBlanc Electrical Contracting Company, number 1106. There also appears to be a number of mysterious cutouts in it. Do you recognize it? Yes. It was found during the search at Sloan Construction. Where specifically was it found? in an office occupied by Miss Pamela O'Neill in her desk. Was this the only such invoice you found there? No. There were four others with similar cutouts. Mr. Maxwell, in your long experience, have you ever before been confronted by this type of cutout business? On a number of cases. What was their purpose? I wonder, Your Honor, if we might confine testimony to the present case. Please do, Mr. Mason. Of course. Mr. Maxwell, on the day of the search at Sloan Construction, did you take samples from all the typewriters in the office? We did. 
Were these samples analyzed? Yes, at the RCMP Crime Detection Laboratory. Did you obtain a sample from the typewriter of Miss Pamela O'Neill? Yes, she typed it herself. Strange looking, aren't they, with those cutouts? Do you recognize those invoices, Miss O'Neill? The court has heard testimony from Special Investigator Maxwell that they were found in your desk. Do you recognize them? Yes. Did you make those cutouts? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear the answer. Would you please speak up? Yes. Thank you. May I have Exhibit 14, please? Miss O'Neill, I assure you now what purports to be a photocopy of invoice number 1106 from Leblanc Electrical Contracting. It reads, additional electrical installation at Embassy Apartments, $13,250. Do you recognize it? I'm not sure. Miss O'Neill, did you manufacture this photocopy by using this cutout invoice? Did you use your typewriter, from which a sample has been placed in evidence, to type the false description and amount? Was it carefully typed on a blank sheet of paper like this one, and then fitted under the cutout invoice like this, with the false information filling the cutout areas? Did you then photocopy this composite to produce an entirely false invoice copy? Miss O'Neill, did you manufacture this photocopy of invoice 1106? Yes. By the method I described? Yes. Did you raise the amount by $10,000? I think that was it. Did you make other false invoices in this manner? Yes. Did you know that they were to be used for the purpose of tax evasion? No. Then what did you think they were for? I wasn't told. Were you instructed to make these false photocopies? Yes. By whom? Mr. Harmon. Claude Harmon, the company's secretary treasurer. Yes. Did Mr. Sloan give you any instructions concerning these false invoices? No. Are you certain of that, Miss O'Neill? The witness has answered the question with respect. She has. Sorry, Your Honor. Miss O'Neill, did you receive any extra payment for making these false invoices? No. You testified earlier that you joined Sloan Construction in January 1967 as a stenographer, correct? Yes. I show you now what appears to be your income tax return for 1967. Do you recognize your signature? Yes. And what was your total salary from Sloan Construction? $4,228.50. I show you now what appears to be your return for the following year. <clears throat> Do you recognize it? Yes. And what was your total salary from the company for that year? $10,000. Mm -hmm. I received a promotion. A promotion? Yes. A promotion to what? To administrative assistant. To whom? Mr. Sloan. What is your present salary, Miss O'Neill? 14,500. I wonder if you'd outline for the court your formal business training. I took a course at Miss Burns Business College. What kind of course? Typing. Can't you simply tell the court you didn't know what Harmon was doing? I can't tell the court anything. I won't be taking the stand. What do you mean? Defendants never testify in these cases. Bearden doesn't want to expose Dad to cross-examination. I mean, I can understand that the firm would be responsible for Harmon's actions, but if you didn't know what he was doing, you can't be held personally responsible. You didn't know, did you? Everybody cuts corners. Maybe it wouldn't be necessary if you weren't so generous with some of your employees. Mr. Franklin, I show you now what appears to be a postcard photograph of Mr. and Mrs. Alan Sloan with a caption reading, On the Beach at Waikiki. 
The postcard is addressed to Mr. Gerald Sloan, and the message is signed, Mom and Dad. It's postmarked Honolulu, Hawaii, February 12th, 1968. Do you recognize it? Yes, sir. It was among some papers we seized at the Sloan residence. What significance, if any, did this postcard have in your investigation? Oh, it established Mr. Sloan's whereabouts on that date. I now show you what appears to be a summary invoice for 1968 from the Happy Wanderer Travel Agency. Do you recognize it? Yes, sir. It was found during the search at Sloan Construction. Does the invoice include a list of the trips for Mr. Sloan? Yes, it does. Does it indicate that Mr. Sloan was on a business trip on February 12th, 1968? Yes, it does. New York, February 10th to 14th. And where does this postcard indicate that Mr. Sloan was at this time? Vacationing in Hawaii. After making this interesting discovery, did you then pay a visit to the Happy Wanderer Travel Agency? Almost immediately. I spent a whole day examining their books and records with one of our assessors. With what results, Mr. Franklin? We found what we believe to be a considerable number of irregularities, not only confined to this case. Did you apprise the travel agency of your findings? No, sir, not at that time. What did you do? We prepared an affidavit showing evidence of complicity in tax fraud and obtained a warrant. Then on March 4th, 1971, we conducted a search and seizure at the travel agency's premises and at the home of the owner, Mr. Felix Wasserman. Mr. Wasserman, are you telling this court that you defrauded Sloan Construction of $12,760? No. He owed me this money for other trips. Other trips? Yes. Pleasure trips. Pleasure business? What's the difference? Money is money. The uh, government might not agree with you in that. Mr. Wasserman, in the three succeeding years up to the search and seizure at your premises in March 1971, did you continue to accommodate Mr. Sloan by issuing invoices that listed pleasure travel as business trips? Yes. Why did you do this? It's the only way that I could keep the business. Would you state your full name and occupation, please? Bruce Alexander Dixon. I'm executive secretary of the Riverside Yacht Club. Is uh, Alan Sloan a member of your club? Yes, he's one of our directors. Mr. Dixon, on uh, June 17th, 1970, was your club the scene of a wedding anniversary party for Mr. and Mrs. Sloan? Yeah, I believe that was the date. Their 25th wedding anniversary? Yes. Were you in attendance at this celebration? Well, yes. The whole affair was under my personal supervision. And uh, how would you describe the affair, Mr. Dixon? Well, I should say it was uh, among the most impressive ever held at our club. Really? What made it so impressive? Well, the size, for one thing. We catered to over 300 guests, exquisite menu, distinctive wine list. Quite grand. Quite. Mr. Dixon, I have here what appears to be your file for Sloan Construction. Do you recognize it? Yes, it was taken by the tax department last year. From this file, I show you now what appears to be a summary of the cost of the anniversary party. Yes. What was the total cost of the party? $8,450. Did you receive any special instructions as to how this was to be billed? Yes. Yes. Well, we were asked to divide the total bill into 12 equal amounts and then to add them to the regular monthly invoices for the coming year. Monthly invoices to whom? Sloan Construction. Was the anniversary party mentioned in any of the invoices? No. Mr. Dixon, why did you agree to issue such invoices? Well, I was advised that the affair pertained to business, in a way, and was legally chargeable as such. Did you question Mr. Sloan on this? Well, no. Why not? Well, you don't question a man of Mr. Sloan's integrity. He wouldn't be a director of our club without the highest standards of... Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Riverside is one of the oldest, most exclusive clubs on the continent. You may cross-examine. Mr. Dixon, concerning the anniversary party, did Mr. Sloan not explain to you that a great many of his business associates were invited? That, in a sense, the grandeur of the affair had its value in terms of business promotion? He did mention that, yes, sir. 
Thank you. The witness may step down. What do you want me to tell Dad? The truth. My father isn't well and he's an old man. It'll cheer him up to see me again. You know about the situation at the office? The Americans squeezing us out? I'm sorry your father's affairs aren't going as well as they used to. That's what he said. The money just isn't there anymore. And five minutes later, Schenker called from New York. He said if the Canadian money isn't coming through, they'll have to protect their investment by putting up the rest themselves. But with 80%, they want the name changed. To what? Schenker Towers? Everything falling apart while I'm sitting in that bloody courtroom day after day. My turn tomorrow. I told you, there's nothing to worry about. We've got to settle with them. I'm getting them off my back once and for all. And how long have you been employed by Mr. Sloan? Six years in August. As rental agent for the Majestic Apartments, can you tell us how many units there are in that building? 300 apartments. Between 1968 and 70, were they all rented on long-term leases? Most of them. Most of them? All except 20. Could you tell the court how those 20 were rented? By the day, by the week, uh, short term. Like a hotel? Yes. Mostly to American tourists. Did you keep um, account books or payment ledgers for these short-term rentals? Uh, no. Why was that? I was instructed not to. Instructed by whom? Mr. Harmon. Miss Blanchard, I have here what appears to be three notebooks, labeled 1968, 69, and 70, with handwritten entries. Do you recognize the handwriting? It's mine. And uh, what do these entries represent? Payments by short-term guests. I understood that you were instructed not to keep such records. Well, yes, but these are for myself. I felt I should have them. Why, Miss Blanchard? Well... Mr. Sloan questioned my figures once, and from that time on, I felt I should have some protection. Mr. Harmon, is it a fact that for the years 1968, 69, and 70, income derived from short-term rentals for 20 furnished units in the Majestic Apartments, income totaling $176,283 was not reported for taxation purposes? I don't believe so. Why not? Because, because of a breakdown in our accounting system. All our other apartments are rented on long-term leases. Somehow the bookkeeper omitted these. Quite an omission, wouldn't you say? Mr. Harmon, <clears throat> do you have supervision of the Sloan Construction Company payroll? General supervision. I show you now, it appears to be, the 1969 payroll ledger for Sloan Construction. Do you recognize it? Yes. Would you open it to page two, please? Is the name Hannah Stephan listed there? Please answer the question. Yes, it is. Is her occupation indicated? Yes. What is her occupation as indicated there? Office clerk. And her annual salary? $3,200. Is Hannah Stephan really an office clerk, Mr. Harmon? No. Would you tell the court her true occupation? A domestic. Employed by whom? Mr. Sloan. At his residence, 38 Riverside. Yes. Mr. Harmon, whose idea was it to list Hannah Stefan as an office clerk? It was my idea because of all the entertaining Mr. Sloan was doing for business purposes. Did Mr. Sloan approve of the idea? Yes, but he wasn't aware of all the details. These details you referred to, were they itemized in the income tax returns of Sloan Construction? Yes. And Mr. Sloan, as president of the company, signs the income tax returns? Yes, but he couldn't possibly have read every item, every detail. How can you be sure that he couldn't possibly have read every item, every detail? Mr. Sloan can read. 
Yes. And as beneficial owner of the company, he is responsible for income tax returns, is he not? Well, I suppose. Thank you. That's all. Could this be entered as our next exhibit? Number 73. You may cross-examine. Mr. Harmon, how long have you been with Sloan Construction? Since the beginning. 22 years. It was a very small operation then. Yes, we started out building summer cottages. What was your first position with the company? Bookkeeper. Your position now? Secretary Treasurer. Mr. Harmon, do you have a degree in accounting? No. Well, what is your training then? Well, I took some night courses and I learnt the rest on the job. So as the company grew, you grew with it? That's right. As the company became larger and larger, were you ever concerned that you might be replaced by a fully qualified chartered accountant? No. Mr. Sloan was always very good to me. And you were grateful to Mr. Sloan? Yes. You wanted to do all you could for the company? Of course. Is it possible, Mr. Harmon, that you may perhaps have been somewhat overzealous in your efforts to help the company? Well... Mr. Harmon, has it consistently been one of your responsibilities with Sloan Construction to prepare the company's tax return? Yes. Over a period of 22 years? Yes. And did Mr. Sloan develop confidence in your ability to prepare the company's returns? I believe so. In view of Mr. Sloan's blind confidence in your ability, confidence developed and continuously confirmed over a period of 22 years, would you say that it is possible, just possible, that Mr. Sloan wasn't aware of the contents of the disputed income tax returns which he signed? Yes. It is possible? Yes. Would you say further that it's probable? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. What's going to happen to Harmon? Well, none of his statements can be used against him. Well, isn't it going to be a little embarrassing, uh, keeping him around after all he's admitted? I'll probably get him something else. Plenty of people owe me favors. So Bearden's pretty sure he can swing it. We'll be paying enough. What if he's wrong? Oh, these cases are always settled this way. I've authorized him to go the limit. A maximum fine, if necessary. It's a lot of money, Paul. We'll agree to the maximum. Double the tax owing, plus 10000 on each of the five charges. It comes to $680,450. With interest, it makes the tax department's total recovery almost a million. The indictment decision was made by the Minister of Justice. Besides, the mandatory imprisonment provision is precisely for flagrant cases like this. Sloan's only flagrant offense was to entrust his tax affairs to an incompetent bookkeeper. You think anyone believes that an operator like Sloan didn't keep track of every penny in that company? Harmon has testified that Sloan probably didn't know what he was signing. Wait till we brought out the rest of the evidence. Like the other houses Sloan built for associates in Vancouver and Montreal, with the costs transferred to apartment buildings, and the $15,000 worth of false restaurant receipts. <laughs> then there's the matter of the family cars. Not only were the expenses charged to the company, but there was that cute deal where the cars didn't cost him a red cent in the first place. Uh -huh. Perhaps you'd care to fill me in on that cute deal. It's in the charges. Every time the company bought a dump truck, Sloan would have the dealer charge the company an extra thousand or so and credit the difference to his account. After buying two or three trucks, there'd be enough in the account to buy a new car for his son or his wife. Sounds like another of Harmon's bright ideas. I started from nothing. I sweated and saved $8,000 to build four tar paper cottages in Muskoka country. And then another four. And then all those crummy veterans' houses. 
And when I took on a job of a sink or a swim, and there were anything to fall back on. And when I met that holier-than-thou mother of yours from the right side of the tracks, what a family. I thought her father lent you the money for your first apartment building. Yeah. And they never let me forget it. Sloan Towers is my chance to finally get clear of them. What good can it possibly do to put a man like this in jail? For years, we've been handing out fines, and what good has that done? In most cases, we nail them for only a fraction of what they've gotten away with, so even with the fine, they end up ahead. What you're saying is you intend to make an example of Sloan. We served notice a couple of years ago that we'd be going by indictment in flagrant cases. The mandatory prison term was mentioned. Two months to five years. And do I take it you will be recommending a monetary penalty as well? Yes. And you don't think you're hitting him too hard? Ruining him, in fact. Oh, come on, you know what he's worth. What about his name? Maybe he should have thought about that. Maybe he should have thought about a lot of things. The man robs a bank, we put him away for 10, 20 years. Someone like Sloan steals hundreds of thousands of dollars, lives like a king. Who pays for it? 